Good evening, everyone. It's April the 1st, 2020, and once again, we are holding our services online, and I know that many of you are getting antsy about meeting together again real uh, soon, and I want you to know that Miss Paul and I are as well. We know that our fellowship is critical uh, to our survival as a church body, but don't be discouraged. Don't be disheartened. Our God is faithful, and he will uphold us with his right hand. Uh, one of the favorite verses of one of our members and it's fast becoming one of my favorites, is Isaiah 41.10, uh, which says, For thou, uh, or fear thou not, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. I will strengthen thee, yea, I will help thee, yea, I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. That'd be a great verse for all of us uh, to consider on a daily basis and even to memorize so we can quote uh, regularly. This evening, we're only going to be doing our Bible study together without our regular uh, singing and services. Uh, my camera only records about 33 minutes or so, and uh, so I want to get all of this on one video instead of two. We do have a new camera on the way that will allow us to not only do what we're doing, but also allow us to live stream on our app, and hopefully we'll have that started either by next Wednesday or the following uh, Sunday, and uh, it'll record as long as we need it to. But let's begin with a word of prayer, and then we'll get started with our Bible study tonight in 1 John chapter number 3. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, God, we thank you for uh, this time that we have to come together as a church body to study your word and to, uh, Lord, to learn some things about you. God, I pray that you would continue to be with our folks uh, during this time, uh, uh, encouraging them, strengthening their faith, uh, even though, Lord, we're separated uh, by uh, the distance uh, that we have to because of this virus. God, I pray that this would end quickly, and I pray that you would just intervene. Uh, Lord, but uh, Lord, we're also asking for your will to be accomplished. God, we pray that you would be with us now as we study your word, and Lord, we give you all the praise and all the glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Last time in our first John Bible study, we had just gotten started here in chapter 3, where John talks about some of the marks or the traits of those abiding or living in Christ. Uh, the first mark we were discussing uh, was that of abiding in righteousness or living a life that is right in the eyes of God and, and, and a life that is, uh, quite frankly, pleasing to him. Uh, doing so proves our love for the brethren or for brothers and sisters in Christ because we're giving them a godly example to live by. Abiding in righteousness, we also found out, means that our living will be foreign or strange to those around us. The world uh, lives or abides in unrighteousness and produces unholy fruit, uh, while abiding in righteousness uh, or living in Christ uh, produces the fruit of the Holy Spirit. So, so our life will be, the way we live our life will be foreign to, way, to the way the world lives theirs. Uh, if everyone thinks your Christian life all right, or the way you live is odd or strange, then you're probably doing something right. You're probably abiding in righteousness. And of course, abiding in righteousness also means living a pure and a holy life. It is God's will for all believers to live that sanctified life. Though we'll not be perfect or sinless, as, we'll, as we're going to discuss tonight, our desire to be purer, our desire to be holier will be a continual driving force of our life. Let's pick it up where we left off in verse 4. Now, I want to read through verse 10, uh, but we'll come back and we'll take it verse by verse as we normally do. John writes here in verse 4, Whosoever committeth sin transgresseth also the law, for sin is the transgression of the law. And we know that he was manifested to take away our sins, and in him is no sin. Whosoever abideth in him sinneth not. Whosoever sinneth hath not seen him, neither known him. Little children, let no man deceive you. He that doeth righteousness, or abides in righteousness, like we've been talking about, is righteous even as he is righteous. He that committeth sin is of the devil. For the devil sinneth from the beginning. For this purpose the Son of God was manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin, for his seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin because he is born of God. In this the children of God are manifest, and the children of the devil. 
Whosoever doeth not righteousness is not of God, neither he that loveth not his brother. Those abiding in righteousness are basically what this is saying, is that those abiding in righteousness will not abide in sin. That's going to be the focus of our entire discussion this evening. Now, I know that when we read a passage like that, that some of you might be thinking, oh my goodness, Brother Morton, I must not be saved because I know I sin. Okay, well, just slow your roll a little bit there. Uh, and don't forget about what John wrote earlier. Flip back to chapter number one, if you will, and notice what he said there, uh, beginning in verse number eight. He wrote there, if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. Uh, now, wait a minute. He just said that, that anybody that sin is not, is not born of God. And yet here he says, if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. Of course, he also goes on to say, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins. And to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But watch also verse 10. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar. And his word is not in us. You see, just because we're, we're saved doesn't mean we'll never sin again. But because we are saved, our overwhelming desire should be to not only continually, uh, but, but should be to continually to remain in, to live in, are not to abide in sin. Now, let me rephrase that because I think I messed that up a little bit. Because we are saved, our overwhelming desire should not be to continually remain in, live in, or abide in sin. John is not saying in our passage here that someone who commits a sin cannot be saved. He's talking about a mark or a trait of a believer who is remaining in, living in, or abiding in Christ not remaining in, living in, or continually abiding in sin. Someone truly abiding in Christ or living for Christ will be sold out to him, and when a particular sin is revealed unto them, their overwhelming desire will be to rid themselves of that sin. As John wrote in, first, uh, in, in, in chapter number 1, verse 9, they will confess that sin to God who will then forgive them of their sin and cleanse them from all unrighteousness, and then they will take the immediate steps to get rid of that sin completely out of their lives. If they don't take the necessary steps to overcome that sin, then they will abide in or continue to live in that sin. Verse 6 is the key here to understanding. He says, Whosoever abideth in him, or abideth in Christ, sinneth not. Whosoever sinneth hath not seen him, neither known him. John is talking about lifestyles here. If we're abiding in Christ, then we're not going to be abiding in our sin. Does that make sense? But don't take this too lightly either. If someone is abiding in their sin, living in their sin, then there might be a good chance they're not saved. Why? Well, if someone is saved, then that means that the Holy Spirit is living within them. And we know that one of the things that the Holy Spirit does for us is that he convicts us of our sin so that we'll get those things right in our life and no longer sin. A true believer will always want to be right in the eyes of God or want to abide in Christ. The guilt of our continual sin will continually hound us until we get it right. We'll want to be like the prodigal son and get out of the pig pen so to speak, because we'll know that something is not right in our life. Now, don't get me wrong. I do believe that a believer can become cold and indifferent to the conviction of the Holy Spirit in their life. But there's no way they'll be able to uh, uh, abide in righteousness or abide in Christ or have a good, solid Christian testimony that is effective for God and still be able to abide in their sin. That is not possible. Now remember, John addressed this to, to, to little children or babes in Christ so that everyone would understand how important it is for us not to abide in sin or not to continually live in our sin. Unfortunately, too many Christians today don't believe they can overcome particular sins, and so they just, they just give up trying. I mean, that's just generally the way it works, but, but it's only because they've never given an honest effort to overcoming sin God's way. Now they may say, oh, Brother Morton, I've tried, I've tried, I've tried, I've tried, I've tried, I've tried. Have you tried it God's way and how he tells us to overcome sin? You see, they've always tried 
to get rid of their sin in their own way and in their own power. And when it doesn't work, then they think it's impossible. But it's only because they're not doing it God's way and in God's power. And by the way, uh, their way might work temporarily. I mean, they might be able to overcome a specific sin for a short amount of time, but it'll, but, but it'll always be in their mind. It'll be, a, it'll be a continual fight for the rest of their life. And look, I know that some sins are that way, but, but look, when we do things God's way, that changes everything. As verse 4 states here, whosoever committeth sin transgresseth also the law. For sin is the transgression of the law. Sin is a transgression or a violation of God's word. And I don't believe any of us would argue with that. It's pretty self-explanatory. But verse 5, in verse 5, John also states, And you know that he, speaking of Christ, was manifested to take away our sin. And in him is no sin. In other words, Jesus came and he died for our sins. As a matter of fact, he was the only one who could because he was the only one without sin. 2 Corinthians 5, 21 says, For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. God made Jesus, who knew no sin, to be sin for us. He made him to be sin for us. Why? That we might be made righteous. Or so that we could be right in the eyes of God. And so we could abide in that righteousness. But because believers know that sin is a violation of God's law, and they know that Jesus Christ died because of those violations, verse 6 says, those who abide in Christ will not abide in sin. Those who do either do not know Christ and have not seen him or do not believe they can overcome sin and they give up trying, which is a sign of spiritual immaturity. Another reason why John addresses babes. That's why he says in verse 7, little children or babes in Christ, that's the, that's the Greek word for infant there. Let no man deceive you. He that doeth righteousness is righteous even as he is righteous. In other words, Christians can live or can abide in righteousness and not have to remain, live, or abide in their sin. In other words, they can overcome it. All right? And John goes on to explain in verses 8 through 10. He says in verse 8, He that committeth sin is of the devil. For the devil sinneth from the beginning. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. Sin began with Satan. All right? He was the first of God's creatures to sin. All right? Not the first man to sin, the first of God's creatures to sin. And then in the Garden of Eden, uh, he also tempted Adam and Eve to sin. And, of course, they fell prey to that temptation. But he is the father of sin. This is why the Son of God... Jesus Christ had to come and die for our sin and destroy the works of the devil. Those who abide in sin, however, John says, are of the devil. The devil is their spiritual father, if you will. You'll remember in John chapter 8, Jesus speaking to the Jewish leadership, here's what he said to them. He said, you are of your father the devil, and the lust of your father will ye do, or ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning. And abode, or abided, we're talking about abiding, not in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. Why did Jesus say this? Because they, the, the Jew, Jewish leadership that would not accept him, abided in sin or righteousness. They were doing exactly what their father, the devil, was doing. But God's people do not have to abide in their sin. They can overcome their sin or abide in righteousness. Verse 9, whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin. For his seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin because he is born of God. Again, this is not saying that a Christian will never sin. Okay, again, I refer you back to, to chapter 1, verses 8 and 10. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and we make God a liar. Okay, this is still talking about abiding in sin or continually living a lifestyle uh, of sin or in a particular sin. 
You can also take this verse from another angle. The new spiritual creature that God has made in us through Christ Jesus uh, cannot sin because it is born of God. But as long as we're alive on this earth, we also still have our old sinful and fleshly nature, which can sin, which is the old man that the Bible talks about. But even from this angle, we also know that as Christians, you and I, the Bible teaches us, are to mortify the deeds of our body or to mortify or deaden the deeds of our flesh. Romans 8.13 says that very clearly. For if ye live after the flesh, if you're going to abide in the flesh or abide in unrighteousness, ye shall die. But if ye through the Spirit do mortify, that word mortify means to deaden. If you through the Spirit of God do mortify the deeds of the body, you shall live. Okay? Romans 6, 6 says, knowing this, that our old man, that's that old sinful person that we were before we became a child of God, the old man is crucified with Christ. It's crucified with him that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve or abide, if you will, in sin. We don't have to abide in our sin. But we still have our old sinful nature and flesh, which causes us to sin. We do not have to abide in sin. We can deaden the deeds of our flesh or overcome them and abide in righteousness. Notice verse 10. In this, the children of God are manifest and the children of the devil. Whosoever doeth not righteousness is not of God, Neither he that loveth not his brother. This is how the, the children, this is how we discern or tell the difference between a child of God and a child of the devil. Now God knows whether or not somebody's a child of his or not, but this is how we can tell. Okay? If we're abiding in sin, in other words, we're living in a continual state of sin and not abiding in righteousness, not loving our brothers and sisters in Christ unconditionally like we're supposed to then there's a good chance that we're not saved at all and that we are children of the devil. Jesus said, by their fruits you shall know them. This is how we perceive each other, all right? Now, God knows what we are and what we're not, but, but this is how we can tell the difference between a child of the devil and a child of God, okay? If we're abiding in righteousness and not abiding in sin, which includes loving the brethren unconditionally, then it will be obvious, manifest, clearly seen, that we're children of God. Those abiding in righteousness will not be abiding in their sin. Now, some, might, some believers might wonder how they can overcome sin. Well, first, as we read in 1 John 1, 9 earlier, it begins with confession. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. I mean, that's very clear. But confession is not all there is to overcoming sin. That's just the first step. Repentance or turning away from that sin and forsaking it is also important. Here's what Proverbs 28, 13 says. He that covereth his sins shall not prosper. You're just going to cover them up and, 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 and act like nothing's really going on. You're not going to spiritually prosper in your life. That's not talking about physical uh, prosperity. Matter of fact, the Bible talks very little about physical prosperity. Usually when it's talking about prosperity, it's talking about spiritual prosperity. You're not going to be able to abide in righteousness if you don't, not, if, if you not only stop or don't confess your sin, but also for a second. He says, if you're just going to cover up your sin, that's what's going to happen. You shall not prosper. But he says, whoso confesseth and forsaketh them shall have mercy. Folks, we need to abandon our sin. We need to abandon it. We need to confess it, and we need to forsake it. We need to abandon it. You say, well, how do we do that? Well, there are several ways. But maybe the biggest one for all of us is not to provide ourselves with easier opportunities to sin. Romans 13 tells us that we're not to make provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. In other words, we shouldn't give ourselves easier opportunities to sin going to bar uh, going to a bar would only provide an alcoholic an easier opportunity to drink correct in the same sense we cannot make it easier or provide opportunities for our own flesh to sin in those areas where we where we struggle and of course we also know that god's way of escape from temptation is the word of god psalm chapter 119 
Verse 11 says, Thy word have I hid in mine heart that I might not sin against thee. Finding verses of scripture to memorize in our hearts and minds and to quote them when the temptations come will also help us to overcome sin. All right, so we've got to confess it. We need to forsake it. We don't need to provide our flesh for an opportunity or an easier opportunity to sin. We need to find verses of scripture that will help us to, to escape the temptation to sin. Those are wonderful ways of overcoming sin. Look, there's many other wonderful ways for us to be able to do that so that we can abide in righteousness and not continue to abide in our sin. There are other things we can do according to Scripture. If you need some help with that, please feel free to contact me in some way. I promise you, I'll find ways to help. Now, if you're here and you're not saved, or if you're listening and you're not saved, or you're not a Christian, then we need to get that taken care of first. And I'd be happy to help you with that as well. But if you're going to abide in righteousness, you cannot abide in your sin. You're going to have to overcome that with your sin. I want you to just bow your heads and maybe close your eyes right where you're at for just a second. And I want you to ask yourself, first of all, am I abiding in my sin or am I abiding in righteousness? Is there, is there a sin in my life that needs to be, that I need to get out of my life that, that, that is controlling me? Is there something that I, that I need to do about that? And I want you to know, if there is, you can overcome it if you're a child of God. If you're not a child of God, I want you to know, Jesus Christ died for your sins. He became sin for you, as we learned earlier, so that you could be made righteous. All you have to do is admit to God that you're a sinner. Believe with all of your heart that Jesus Christ died on the cross and he shed his blood to save you. If you believe that with all of your heart and you confess it with your mouth to the Lord, Romans 10, 9 and 10 tells us that you shall be saved. But you got to believe it and you got to tell him. All right. From that point on, then you can begin to work on not having to abide in your sin. You'll be able to learn how to abide in righteousness as we have learned here uh, tonight. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. We'll be dismissed. If you need some help, you contact me. Heavenly Father, God, we come to you again tonight. Lord, we thank you and we praise you so much for your word and how it speaks to us and the things that we can learn from it. Lord, we don't want to abide in our sin. I don't believe there's a Christian within the sound of my voice that, that truly wants to live in their sin. If that's the case, then there's a good chance they're probably not saved. Lord, we want to we wanna do what's right in your eyes. There's so many promises for living that righteous life. Lord, we want to abide in Christ by abiding in righteousness and by, by not uh, living and abiding in our sin. And I pray that you give us the strength and the courage to do that, to overcome our sin and the ways that you've laid out in your word on how to do that. Lord, I also pray if there's somebody within the sound of my voice who's never uh, asked you into their heart, that they will do so right now. I thank you for that, and I praise you for it. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thank you again so much for joining us. Uh, we will see you again on Sunday morning, and uh, we'll, uh, we'll be uh, hopefully live, but I doubt we'll be live this week. We'll probably be live the following Sunday. Thank you so much.